Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Planet Paddock, formerly known as For the World. I am Tiggy, and today we're so excited to be sitting down for the second time with McLaren's Director of Sustainability, Kim Wilson. We actually had our first ever For the World conversation with Kim, so that was crazy. She helped launch this series over a year ago. But our last conversation with her was about sustainability and diversity at McLaren. A lot has happened in the last year, and McLaren has since emerged as a leader in not just sustainability, but also climate action on the grid and beyond. And they're also killing it, actually on track with probably the fastest car right now. So very excited to be talking about all things sustainability, high performance. Today, we're diving into something super new and exciting with Kim, the applications of motorsport technologies to climate solutions beyond motorsport. So that means McLaren's climate contribution program, the use of recycled carbon fiber, a fully circular F1 car project, much more. But before we launch into our conversation with Kim, let's just set the stage a little bit. So we've talked about this before on the podcast, motorsport acts sort of as an R&D lab for the automotive industry, at least many people, myself included, believe that. And when we think about the tech that comes out of those efforts, we usually focus on the strictly road relevant stuff like efficient engines, car software, hybrid engines. But road cars and all forms of transport and mobility are part of a larger system that, of course, impacts people, cities, ecosystems, you name it. So as a reminder from our last episode with Kim, the transport sector is the end use sector that emits the most carbon emissions globally. So developing and perfecting tech that not only cuts down on the emissions of the transport sector, but also reaches across sectors to help reduce emissions, pollution and waste in other areas, all of that is critical. And McLaren as a manufacturer, a brand, a team is a standout example of an organization we think that is carving out a role for itself as a systems level change maker. Climate solution stories can often get drowned out with all of the very real, very scary news about climate, but this is definitely a story we feel good about covering because McLaren is looking beyond the sport, beyond the industry, all while being super competitive on the grid. So that is very, very important. The two are not mutually exclusive. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview. We did this live at McLaren Technology Center, which still pinching ourselves over. So hope you enjoy. Kim, so lovely to see you and on your home turf. We're so happy to be here. I think you were our first ever guest for our sustainability series that we kicked off last year. So we're very excited to come full circle. (laughs) Amazing. Thank you. I didn't realize that, but um, thank you for coming back. (laughs) No, we're so happy to see it and everything, all the sustainability considerations, just being here at MTC and thinking about both at home and, you know, abroad as well. So really cool to see. Um, Today, we want to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of motorsport technology and applications in the broader climate space and in the broader world. So we have lots to discuss on that topic, but let's start by setting the stage at home. McLaren Racing has four pillars of sustainability. You have net zero, circular economy, DEI, and health and well-being. Can you walk us briefly through that structure and give us a sense of how sustainability takes shape at McLaren? Absolutely. So um, we've really looked at our impacts in terms of both social and environmental sustainability. So you can see we have two pillars that focus on environment and two on social. And it's where we think we can have the most positive impact um, within our team and society, but also we need to take responsibility for reducing Um, you know, making things better within our own operations. Um, So in terms of net zero, I'm really proud to say that we are the first Formula One team to have had our science-based targets um, validated for net zero by the science-based targets (laughs) initiative. That's been, you know, quite an achievement and there's so much more work to go to do that, but that means we are validated to have targets in line with a 1.5 degree pathway to achieve net zero by 2040 and halve our emissions by 2030. And within that net zero platform as well, we've also got um, a program outside of our reductions, which I can talk about in a bit more detail later around how we're going to give back to society in terms of climate contributions. Very closely related to that, (laughs) circular economy. 
we're using way too much resources on our planet at the moment. We have an absolute responsibility to look at how much we're using, how we can close the loop on, on waste and, and increase recycled content and use more bio-based materials and move away from using materials that are plastics, fossil fuel derived, those sorts of things. So we've got a program around um, how can we design and develop a circular Formula One car yes. as our big flagship <laughs> on that, which is quite exciting. We're excited to chat about that. <laughs> <laughs> On the social side, um, we have, um, you know, we are wanting to set the standard for what diversity, equity and inclusion looks like mm -hmm. in our sport. And we know that whilst we've come a, a massive way over the last few years, we've got a long way to go. Yeah. So we've leaned in very much on how we um, improve the, the gender balance and, and women in motorsport, and I can talk about that in a bit more detail, but we have a target to um, increase our workforce um, representation from underrepresented groups to 40% by 2030. And that's not just gender, but ethnicity, um, people from the LGBTQ plus community, people with neurodivergence mm -hmm. and disability, people with um, military backgrounds, military veterans. Um, so, so that's that's also an important area of focus and also people from low socioeconomic backgrounds because yeah. it's quite a hard sport to get into if you're not, <laughs> not of a certain background. Um, and then finally, and last but not least, health and well-being is so fundamentally important yeah. because as an elite sports team with um, you know with high pressure, high performance, mm -hmm. performance is our North Star. We really have to protect our people. We have to support them to perform at their best, both physically and mentally. And then how do we role model how we do that to enable others to thrive? Mm -hmm. That's a, a give back that we need to focus on too. Yeah. 100%. I mean, even just being here and seeing the light and the building and just all the physicality. You can physicality. see green from yeah. everywhere, which is such a, you know, important thing. It's beautiful. We're yeah. very lucky and I can share with you some of the things we're doing on our campus yes. as well. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Yeah, that was a really great launch point for us into, you know, kind of understanding the scope of sustainability at McLaren. But let's dive into some specifics now. So one of the really cool things about McLaren is you're striving to make an impact outside of the sport, across disciplines, across industries. And one of those ways is through the Climate Contribution Program. Can you tell us a little bit about your vision and McLaren's vision for that program and the successes you've had so far? Absolutely, this is one that's really close yeah. to my heart. So we launched our Climate Contribution Program at the end of November 2023. And um, this was really about how can we take F1 know-how, expertise, um, the mindset, the culture, the performance focus, and translate that back into how can we help solve some of the world's problems in terms of the climate solutions that are out there, but they just need to scale and accelerate at a much faster pace because we all know that we're running out of time yeah. in terms of, of um, meeting those challenges. It started with, and it's part of our legacy, but how could we do that in a way that was meaningful to us? So it started with me thinking, oh, maybe we should do something everywhere where we go racing, but cross McLaren racing, that's crazy. <laughs> that was just <laughs> too big an elephant, you know, 66 locations yeah. around the world. I was like, we're not going to have a meaningful impact. Yeah. So through a, you know, through, through a very considered exploratory process, we decided to focus in on three projects. Mm -hmm. And that's really focused on two things. One is how do we scale and accelerate the removal of excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Because mm -hmm. we've got too much. And we know to achieve net zero, all these organizations are going to need to buy carbon removal offsets. And there's mm -hmm. just not enough out there that's credible mm -hmm. and meaningful. So how can we address that? And we've got two projects that focus on that, which is Undo, which is about enhanced rock weathering, and Mombak, which is about restoring degraded pasture land in the Amazon and then restoring with biodiverse species. So those are two projects where we have carbon removal credits and we're looking at how we can help them grow their um, organisations and, and, and what they're trying to contribute. The third one is the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and that one is slightly different because it's on that nexus of climate and biodiversity, yeah, which is so important, so important, with nature-based solutions being a really big part of what we need to do to address climate change. But also, we've got an Australian driver, yes. <laughs> and the, 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 reef, the reef is, is, is you know, she needs our help. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, and so we're working with our engineering team called McCurran Accelerator. We sent some engineers out there to help understand how they're restoring coral reefs. So it's their, how they're growing baby coral in the lab, basically, and then putting it back out on the reef. And they're selecting species that will be able to survive the changing climate and how we can do that. But it's at an R&D phase and, and, and that's great and that's fine. But how can we take our engineering know-how and work with them in partnership to help them get to the scale mm -hmm. that the world needs? So we've got a goal to help them develop automated deployment machines so they can put those baby coral into devices that are kind of like cradles and then yeah. <laughs> put them out into sea, but in an automated way so that we can massively scale up the, yeah. the level of impact. So talking about the Great Barrier Reef, and we love all of the sustainability report, but we particularly love the picture of Oscar. <laughs> that was in Australia, is that right? And so tell us about that trip. You went with Oscar to the Great Barrier Reef, to Australia. What was that like? Any fun memories from that time? So we went with um, with Oscar and the, the team from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and some journalists because we really wanted to take advantage of the fact that Oscar was out in and the team were out in Australia anyway for the Australian Grand Prix and, to, and you know, to show him what we were doing and to show the journalists what we were doing so that we could bring it to life and make it real because one of our big opportunities is to help shine the spotlight on the problem and inspire others to see these are the sorts of solutions that, you know, unusual partnerships could end up having a real positive impact. So that was the point of it. It was a fleeting visit, but um, he was amazing and he really absorbed the information. He was very considered about listening and learning. And I guess the highlight for me um, was we, we went out and had a swim yeah. on the reef. <laughs> and that was amazing because we got to see some beautiful um, sea life underwater and I was particularly happy because um, I saw a turtle swim Aww. underneath me and, <laughs> and I know it's about the coral but it was also that as well um, and that's so special um, and it was great to see that the reef was still sustaining that life but the, the other point to be really clear about was it's a reef that they didn't think the bleaching was going to happen on mm. because it was that far south and it is yeah. and you could see and it doesn't mean that it's going to die for sure because it can recover the problem is is that you know, the reef keeps getting hit by all sorts of events that it doesn't have time to recover. And that's why that's why she needs our help. Absolutely. It's such a fun trip. <laughs> One of the cool things I think that that trip really highlighted was yeah. this growing piece of the conversation we're hearing in motorsport, which is this intersection between biodiversity and motorsport, yeah. which are two things you really wouldn't think would be connected. <laughs> so how's McLaren sort of approaching helping ecosystems and biodiversity when that might not really be in the purview? So as you mentioned, I think let's start at home. So the, the um, McLaren Technology Centre campus, we actually, um, we are custodians of a wildflower meadow and mm -hmm. quite a lot of land around where we, we are based. And so one of the first things that um, I did with my team when I joined two and a half years ago was we did an assessment of the biodiversity value, a scientific one, of what, what we have here that we need to protect and enhance. And, um, and so we've been slowly working with our team around, you know, what can we do to build more habitats for insects and, and, and create more natural spaces because it can look a little bit manicured, but mm -hmm. there are opportunities to do that. And then the exciting thing is we've just also, I know it's not a purely diversity um, piece, but we have given a home to um, some beehives and yes. some bees. Um, <laughs> Claire and honey, we're looking out for it. <laughs> yeah. Let the bees have their honey first and then we can, we can maybe Any look at the excess. Yeah. <laughs> and let them have their wax. Yes, and let them have their wax first, and then and then we can look at that. Um, but you know, it's about how do we how do we enhance the the opportunities we have there. And yes, we are doing some infrastructure projects. We need to, but we are ensuring that we give back more biodiversity gain through the the, the surrounding um, landscaping than we had before we did that work. So that's important. And then, of course, the Great Barrier Foundation is clearly um, about restoring ecosystems because uh, damaged ecosystems, because coral reefs, whilst they're only 1% of the seafloor, they are 20, supporting 25% of marine life. So keeping them alive is important. Um, in terms of Mombak, they're planting with biodiverse species to ensure that that land that's very degraded can re restore and support the, the Amazon and the rainforest, which I would char characterise as the lungs of the planet. Yeah. So that's important. But even undo, where it might not seem as obvious and understandable to people, um, 
that's about taking rock that enhances um, soil health and spreading it on the soil. So in the way that ag on agricultural land, they lime the fields to increase crop yields, they're also spreading rock on there that, that can do that while storing carbon. But eventually that carbon ends up back in the ocean and that helps alkaline our, um, our oceans that are, are getting um, more acidic. Yeah. So that's also a way of doing that. So we have things that we can do to help. Yeah. And I love that you're thinking both near and far at home and elsewhere. But bringing it back to home, so we mentioned the circular car project earlier. I want to talk about recycled carbon fiber, one of the biggest innovations and breakthroughs that McLaren has had. So talk to us about how the team has approached that technology and any breakthroughs there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, recycled carbon fiber is something that um, we've been wanting to look at for a while, and we were re really excited yeah. to find a supplier of e-carbon who have been able to produce high quality recycled carbon fiber where we're, the tensions always, and the risk is always car performance versus mm -hmm. sustainability. And um, we've found this source of recycled carbon fiber that's 90% less carbon intensive than um, standard carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. And we trialed it and ran it on the car at the um, Austin yeah. um, US Grand Prix last year. And we did it on some panels that weren't going to affect performance, which and, and it didn't, mm -hmm. and it worked. So then this year at Silverstone, we did it again, and on, we ran it on Oscar's car on some panels on mm -hmm. behind the side pods. And um, again, he ran it in, in free practice and did really well. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been fantastic. It's an innovative material. We believe there's a lot of potential in it. Where we are now is we, we need to work with the regulators to enable us to innovate and do more. But the vision being that eventually we could be, if the regulations allow and the market allows, we should be able to use this on anywhere we're using carbon fiber on yeah. the car. That would be an incredible vision. We're not there yet, yeah. but that's, <laughs> that's where we should try and get to. Yeah, and especially with a material like carbon fiber, which is one of the more tricky ones to recycle, the fact that we're putting it under pressure in such a high pressure environment and it's withstanding that test, I think is a great, you know, um, sort of signal to the rest of the market that you can do these things sustainably and not have to sacrifice high performance. But shifting gears a little bit, pun fully intended, <laughs> um, we'd love to discuss McLaren's sustainable aviation fuel and sustainable marine fuel programs, both with Ecolab and otherwise. A lot of criticism from fans and pros alike is, you know, of course, leveraged at the calendar and so much of the logistics. But McLaren is really making an effort to shift a lot of the air freight to sea freight, yeah. ground freight, and, you know, but in some cases you simply can't get around some of these things. So how has McLaren approached this challenge and what can it contribute to sustainability in these areas? So you're absolutely right. Look, we're a global sport. We can't get away from the fact that how do we go racing globally if we don't fly people and things around the world? So the first thing is making sure that we are really being thoughtful about what we send, how we send it, how much we send. And we've there's been a massive project to reduce the amount of things that we send from air freight and move it into sea freight because that's 99% less carbon intensive mm -hmm. than, than air freight. And yes, we have to have more sets, but it's still net impact better than air freight. And we've achieved about 10% reduction doing that. But we now need to look at what does it look like in terms of sustainable aviation fuel. It's a very, very nascent market. Mm. And what Ecolab are helping us with is figuring out how do we dip our toe in and take that first step in an authentic, meaningful way. So we are, um, they have a, um, a sustainable aviation fuel hub in Minnesota, and we're work they're helping us understand what does that look like to meet our science-based targets mm. um, and, and emissions reductions, but, but start looking at how we can inset using sustainable aviation fuel. And that's important because Again, a bit like the Climate Contribution Programme, if we can show that we support that market, it's a bit like when we were back in the day when everyone was looking at renewable electricity. Yeah. It's how do, you, how do you invest in that to show that you want support and more investment in that space and create the demand. So that's what we're looking at there. Yeah, oh, that's super exciting. We're excited about the impact and the implications beyond just motorsport. And I think that brings us to the next question, which is, We've talked about a lot of different technologies, but what are you most excited about when it comes to impact beyond motorsport, impact beyond, you know? 
I know I've already talked about recycled carbon fiber, yeah. but we just need to think about the fact that there is an awful lot of carbon fiber out there on the market that doesn't have a second life. Mm -hmm. Think of all those wind turbines that are going to be decommissioned that we've invested in. I know that there's going to be a, an, a lot of them coming down in Scotland, for example, in the UK. Think about the automotive industry. There is such a huge amount of virgin carbon fiber out there that needs to be recycled. So I, I, I would back that. Yeah. as something that if we can prove it's good enough for Formula One technically, if then it can be good enough for other uses in industry. Yeah. 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 And talking about, you know, uses across industries and across series, McLaren of course is home to five different series. Which six is, actually, six. if you count F1 Academy. Oh, brilliant, yeah. brilliant, <laughs> yes. And, you know, that's a huge number of things to manage, but at the same time, what are you able to take learning from one series and apply it to another? How does that ecosystem kind of work together? So it's, um, it's something that I think we're in a really unique position um, at, at McLaren Racing to do. So, um, you know, a good example is Extreme E. They had a legacy project program. So it is where I looked first when I was trying to design the climate contribution program and take their learnings and what's best. And that's where we've ended up on international projects, but where we are leaving a positive legacy. Um, another example would be, I, I hate to bring up COVID, but off yeah. the back of off the back of COVID, we had to think about how do we go racing without sending people, um, you know, abroad. And so this concept of mission control, where some of the race team are based here mm -hmm. and the race strategy team, and then they don't travel, but they are uh, they use technology to to connect back to to the track during the race and support that. That's something that we've also been looking at for, for other series as well. So just a real couple of examples of, yeah. of where you, you take those ideas. I think the third one I'd just flag is the F1 circular car. Um, they did some work on Formula E on the life cycle um, carbon impact of the car. And, and that was our starting point to think, how do we do this for our car? Yeah. Um, and we've been working with our partner to Deloitte to then build on that. So some yeah. examples. And so we've talked a lot about technical solutions, but how about non-technical solutions when it comes to social sustainability or other things where you're trying to drive systemic change in a way that's not necessarily has, doesn't necessarily have technology at front and center. What are some of those things? I know there's a lot to choose from, but what are some of those things that excite you on that front? So I think um, I'll pick um, our, our 60 Scholars yeah. program. We met some of them at the Formula E weekend. Which oh, was fantastic. Amazing. So very exciting. So last year with the 60th anniversary of McLaren Racing, again, it was thinking about legacy, but in a human way. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to create a program where we could provide the opportunity to 60 women who want careers in STEM to have the opportunity to network, have masterclasses, get an insight into what um, what we do in, in Formula One and motorsport, and so created a summer program for them. Um, and that was in partnership with some of our amazing partners, because that's the other p place where we can have real positive impact, mm -hmm. is through collaboration through our amazing partner ecosystem. So Google, Cadence, and Cisco were our inaugural partners there. We actually launched the phase two um, the next stage yesterday. Congratulations. Um, um, and we have um, Google and Cisco and um, Deloitte um, mm -hmm. supporting that program and um, Udemy providing their um, learning yeah. platform to, to support that. So I'm super excited about that. But just going back to last year's program, impact is really important to me. And I'm so happy to say that six of the 60 scholars mm -hmm. either have roles at McLaren Racing or in Extreme E at series level. And that is a result of the networks that they made in the, that program. So yeah. it just goes to show from a recruitment perspective, I know the numbers are small, but the turnover of 10% of that cohort then having an opportunity That's is incredible. really amazing. Yeah. And McLaren Racing, but also Extreme E, thinking about the sustainability tie-in there. It's amazing that, that that's where some of these ladies are focused as well. That's great. Yeah, and, you know, thinking about the whole pipeline and how you build a team and how you build a culture. The kind of corporate world in general is, can sometimes really struggle with how to build culture mm -hmm. and DNA around sustainability. But you've, I think, come across as a champion for teamwork and really forwarding collaboration and collaborations-based sustainability. How did you approach building a really solid culture of sustainability at McLaren and what do you think the industry sort of has to learn from that? So 
I think I've been fortunate because leadership is everything and I've come in with with really strong leadership buy-in and back in, so, mm -hmm. uh, backing so I think you know I have to I can't take credit for that <laughs> um, but I think um, collaboration and breaking down barriers is really important and, and leaning in on where everybody's skill sets are um, are going to add value and I think part of that is having to being able to talk the language of the people you're trying to 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 come around to a way of thinking and add sustainability to the lens of their decision making so really building those relationships and tailoring what your ask is of different departments who have different influences has been really really important mm -hmm. um and and so for me that's that's probably been one of the keys but also meeting people where they are yes, i think I, I don't want people to shrink away when yeah. I enter the room and, and, I, and you know, sustainability can sometimes be like the guilt thing. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so recognizing that every little step that somebody takes mm -hmm. is worth it. And taking, and I guess it's helpful in the Formula One culture and the racing mindset of that continuous improvement where, you know, every, every second on track, yeah. you know, tenth of a second on track matters. Um, you know, what we, every pound we spend on performance matters. Mm -hmm. so, so, so then you bring the, the sustainability lens on where things come from, where we source them. All of those small decisions matter and those incremental gains yeah. are, are, are worth counting. Yeah, 100%, it's Formula One after all. <laughs> it's not even tenths anymore, it's hundreds, <laughs> thousands <Yeah>. that matter. <laughs> so that's great to hear. And you work at McLaren Racing and collaborating with all sorts of partners, F1, the FIA, other partners on logistics, technology, all over the place to tackle some of these sustainability challenges. But where do you feel like you have to look outside motorsport, outside F1, outside the FIA to kind of tackle some of the things that are harder to, to figure out within the sport? So I think we are super fortunate at McLaren Racing because we have such an incredible partner ecosystem. Um, you know, we have the most partners um, of, of any other team and everyone has their contribution to make. So I look out to our partners. Um, I look out to other industries and other sports because there are other sports who um, are maybe more advanced than the motorsport yeah. in their sustainability thinking. I'm curious which sports come to mind. Well, it depends on the, the, the subject that yeah. you're, you're, you're interested in. But just as a, as a live example, um, we're having conversations around Team Kit mm -hmm. at the moment. And a lot of work has been done in that space in football, yeah. for example. So if you're looking at where, where sports apparel has gone, you would look to football as a starting point. Yeah. And then there are other things that you'd want to, to look at. Yeah, now tennis is trying to make sustainable tennis balls. <laughs> Recycled carbon yeah. fiber is a good example to go back to where, you know, sailing has looked at it, yeah. golf has looked at it, tennis has looked at it. So you do look at other sports as well yeah. and, and, and take the best of what everyone's done yeah. and build on it. That's, that's great. There's much to be learned across many industries, so we love to hear that. We're going to do a few rapid-fire questions, very easy, hopefully. <laughs> but we want to start with the most beautiful place that we are in now, McLaren Technology Center, MTC. What's your favorite place at MTC? Or what's your favorite part of it? I think um, it might be obvious, but the Boulevard yeah. is really special. Incredible. So for anyone who can't visualize that, it's a it's a most, the most beautiful street at the front of our building with the lake and nature outside on one side. And then for, for the... For the motorsport fans then it's it's almost like a museum of the history of our cars um all the way down the length of that um including um our automotive cars as well and yeah we got to see some of them yeah <laughs> we got to sit in one of the the sports cars which was very cool <laughs> i think the cool thing about you know the boulevard when you take a tour at the mtc that's kind of one of the pieces that you spend the most time in and it's awesome that our tour guides and the other incredible folks in McLaren have brought up how much nature factors into the design and how like nature is the ultimate designer, right? It's ultimate efficiency. So as much as we can do to sort of incorporate that language and put people in places that are designed to facilitate those kind of conversations is so cool. Absolutely. But following up with our next rapid fire question, as the director of sustainability at McLaren, what are some of your favorite sustainable products or places? I know that that can be kind of a thorny question when we're thinking about consuming but sometimes it helps to hear from professionals in the space yeah. for folks that are looking to get started and you know what yeah. can i do what can i use 
Yeah, so um, we have an amazing collaboration with a, um, a not-for-profit in Indianapolis with our Aaron McCarran team called People for Urban Progress, mm -hmm. or PUP, and they took some of our Indy 500 fire suits and they turned them into one-of-a-kind duffel bags that have signatures from our drivers on, um, and they've also then used some of the, the offcuts for um, making like oven gloves and, and pot holders because, you know, it's, it's heat-proof <laughs> and fire safe. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're one-of-a-kind they're useful um, and it gives a second life to something so for me the stuff that people for urban progress do is really exciting and I think we should see more of that I love that cycling <laughs> is great we are sitting in upcycled clothing yes, today amazing. Bringing to the table, so. um, and speaking of the UK what are some of your favorite flora or fauna here <laughs> so much to choose from um, I'm not going to overthink this yeah. um, <laughs> there's, <fire>. yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a baby robin in my oh, garden no. at the moment who um, sits and entertains me in the evening oh, no. and I just love to see that even though I live right in the centre mm. of London yeah. the bird life is, is still there and, and it's cute it's iconic as a robin yeah. <laughs> last question but certainly not the least what is your favourite F1 race? Um, I'm going to say the first one I ever went to, which was Imola in 2022, wow. because by um, it wasn't it wasn't expected, but Lando actually got a podium and came yeah. third at that race, and it the team wasn't feeling like we were in a position to even have a car mm -hmm. that could get a podium, and just to see that reaction and what it's all about was pretty special. For your first race, that's incredible. <laughs> it's just exemplary of the luck that you bring yeah. to the team. <laughs> the, the other ones I went to didn't. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> well, Kim, thank you so much. This has been enlightening for us. We always learn so much when we talk with you and really appreciate the time and sharing all this amazing wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.